A very good evening to all the participants. We welcome you to the 50th leadership conversation today with an iconic leader that we have, Dr. K. Radhakrishnan, the man of Mars Planet Mission. Uh, very good evening, sir, and welcome you to this 50th conversation. We're Thanks, you. Excited to have you, sir. Thank you. On behalf of everyone at ICFI and on behalf of all the participants, I take it my privilege and pleasure to welcome you, sir. And what we will do is we will conserve a lot of time for you so that you can speak and answer several questions that the participants have. And I will only take a little bit of time for introducing you, sir, with your permission, and then hand it over back to you. Thank so you. Allow me to share the screen, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, this is the 50th conversation, and we are going to talk about the leadership lessons from the journey to Mars. And here is the introduction. We have none other than uh, Dr. Radhakrishnan with us. Super delighted, actually. The schedule is very, very simple. For the first 25 minutes or so, our uh, guest leader, Dr. Radhakrishnan, will speak, followed by the 30, 35 minutes of Q&A, moderated by my esteemed colleague, Professor Prasad, and myself. So a brief introduction. Uh, currently, Dr. Radhakrishnan is uh, the chairman of governing body of IITs, member of the National Security Advisory Board. He held several prestigious positions in the past. Uh, he headed the ISRO between November 2009 and December 2014 as chairman of Space Commission, secretary of the Department of Space and chairman of ISRO. He is known as Mars Man for the successful mission to the planet Mars. Prior to this, he was uh, the director of Vikram Sarabhai Space Center 2007 to 2009, and director of National Remote Sensing Agency, 2005 to 2008 of the Department of Space. Some of the major accomplishments for Sir, uh, as India's space chief, Dr. Radhakrishnan led ISRO to achieve 37 space missions, including several historic feats, uh, the famous one, the Mars Orbiter Mission, MOM, flying Indian cryogenic engine on GSLV, the first experimental flight of the GSLV Mac 3, a re entry experiment of an unmanned crew module, and new space capabilities through IRNSS 1A, 1B, 1C for navigation, GSAT 7 for strategic communication, and RSAT 1 for microwave radar imaging. During his tenure, uh, Dr. Radhakrishnan completed, uh, ISRO completed two joint satellite missions, Megatropics and Saral, with the French National Space Agency and inked another agreement with NASA to jointly build an advanced radar imaging satellite. India's standing in the global space market was enhanced as PSLV launched 18 commercial satellites for 11 countries. Dr. Radhakrishnan charted out clear programmatic directions and nurtured younger generation of leaders for carrying forward the legacy of ISRO. He redefined the Chandrayaan-2 mission with indigenous lander and rover and extending the application of space technologies and tools to all central ministries uh, are, highlight, are some of the highlights of his leadership regime at ISRO. MOM, Mars Orbiter Mission or Mangalyan was conceived, planned and executed within four years, starting from 2010 till the execution 2014 which established India as the first country to have successful mission to Mars in its very first attempt and at significantly low cost, roughly about 4.5 billion rupees. Several recognitions, some of them, Dr. Radhakrishnan received uh, the Padma Bhushan Award in 2014 for his contribution to science and engineering, especially in the field of space science and technology. He has also been confirmed, conferred several honorary doctorates by IIT Kharagpur and 12 other Indian universities. Interestingly, his hobbies uh, have been singing. He has been an accomplished singer and a Kathakali artist. Sir uses effectively his arts and music for relaxation. So with this brief introduction, uh, what I will do is I will go back to Sir and request him to start the session. Just before starting the session, I want to uh, mention that one of our colleagues, Mr. Murli Mohan, has provided this connect to Dr. Radhakrishnan. We are extremely thankful to Mr. Murli, Murli Mohan for providing this connect and arranging. Uh, subsequently, I have had the fortune of interacting with Sir and requesting all the other details. 
So, ladies and gentlemen, let's be ready to learn from Dr. Radha Krishnan. Over to you, sir. Thank you, and please start the session. Thank you. Good evening to all of you, Mr. Sudhagar Rao, for your graceful invitation and also introducing me to my brother in law, Murali Mohan, for introducing me to this institute and Professor Prasad, who is going to be with us, especially during the question and answer sessions. All my young participants who are watching this program online, it has been a great privilege for me to be addressing you today and sharing some of my lessons that I learned in my journey of the past 52 years. Incidentally, it is on 1st April 1971 that I started my professional journey as a trainee in a private sector company for almost a month, followed by my long career in ISRO and for a small period in the Department of Ocean Development and again back to ISRO and still I continue to be associated with ISRO. I learned a lot about this word called leadership during this program. First and foremost, I believe that any engineer, any scientist evolves over his or her career and profession to become a manager, to become a leader, and later a mentor of leaders. And I understood from Mr. Sudhakar Rao that most of you who are participating in this online program are today somewhere in the level of a manager or a leader. And let me share with you what did I learn from this process of evolution. And I consider essentially this journey in four phases, a formative phase, then a phase of observing others, observing great leaders and studying. And then there is a process of evolution. One has to evolve, one has to practice, one has to refine and then perform. And then in the phase that I am today, try to become a mentor of leaders. If you look at this journey, one thing which I have learned that leadership involves people of different aspirations, different skill sets, different cultural backgrounds, different inhibitions, barriers, and all positivities and negativities. The leader should be able to bring all of them together for achieving a purpose. And that purpose is very important. And every one of this team should identify himself or herself with that purpose, with that target. How do we do that? That is the job of the leader. How do you bring the individual's strengths, the excellence that is possible from every individual to be synergized for meeting that purpose? Be it a social organization, be it a commercial enterprise, be it an educational organization, be a voluntary organization, or even an event. And all this happen in a situation, a situation that demands high level of performance from us, a situation that brings a lot of constraints, a situation that brings a lot of uncertainties. And as the world is progressing, we see the uncertainties are getting into different magnitudes. Aside, there is the technology that is advancing exponentially. And between the leader and the people, 
what brings them together, what wills them together is that relation. That relation could be a formal relation given by the authority, or it could be an informal relation. And when all these mix together, you have a wonderful relation develops, a relation with trust, a relation where quality of the leadership is respected, the professional competence is respected, where differences of opinions are encouraged to be brought together to the table and the best available solution to a problem could be brought out by this entire team. And this is where we call it team excellence. And when you talk about team excellence, it's also important that the job is done. Who takes the responsibility for the failure? Who takes the credit for a success? I believe that it is the leader's responsibility to be accountable and say, we failed and I take that responsibility. And it is again his responsibility to say that we have been successful and the credit goes to everyone of my team. The reward system that the leader institutes there should be in conformity with this principle that the leader takes the responsibility for the failure. Let me just bring two examples from my career. I became chairman of ISRO in November 2009. And on my plate, there were a lot of missions to be executed. One of them was testing the cryogenic engine and stage in flight. And that was a project which started in the early 90s. That means almost 18 years of work of several leaders and thousands of engineers, scientists from ISRO family and outside ISRO family. They were all coming to fruition as a flight test with a lot of uncertainties. And we had that test on April 15, 2010. The GSLE, which was supposed to be having a checkered career with many failures and a few successes, did perform very well. And the cryogenic engine ignited. Everyone was happy. But then it didn't stay for more than a minute. It was a failure. That was my first flight as a chairman. Of course, I took the responsibility. I faced the nation. I went and met all my colleagues in all the centers. And of course, we had the plans to revive this whole program and set right what was wrong in this Indian cryogenic engineering stage. There were demands at that time to fly again GSLA for communication satellites to be orbited. And we had to again go with the Russian imported engine and stay that is available. And that was on a Christmas day in 2010. And another small bug sitting up and within a few seconds after the takeoff, we had to destroy that vehicle. And that picture is very well seen in our internets. And the news was mid-air explosion of GSLD. Fantastic news that came on TV. It was not an explosion. It was a destruction of the vehicle by sending a ground command because we saw that the vehicle is going in a wrong direction. But the bottom line is first year of my chairmanship, I had two consecutive failures of GSLB. Also came around that time a controversy. We were in a very difficult situation as an organization, but one has to have the resilience in the organization to come up. That ISRO has in plenty, had it in plenty, and it will be there in plenty in the future too. We came out of it. 
And in January 2014, we had successful flight of Indian cryogenic engineering stage on the GSLV until the recent GSLV flight that failed. We had all successes with GSLV and Indian cryogenic engineering stage. That means whatever steps we took at ISRO, excellent, and they gave the results. Now we have this journey of Mars that happened. And that journey was happening parallelly. In 2010, we had that first failure of the cryogenic engine end stage. We were also working out how do we target a, an interplanetary mission, the first interplanetary mission of India, learning from the experiences of Chandrayaan. And we said we will do it in the minimum possible time. It was a very complex mission, scientifically, technologically, not only launching by the PSLV, we had to move towards Mars and have a 300 days journey in an orbit around sun. And at the end of it, when we reach Mars, we should be able to say that, yes, we are at 500 kilometers plus or minus 50 kilometers after a journey of 660 million kilometers over 300 days and all the systems have to work well. And the propulsion stage, which is supposed to break the spacecraft near Mars should work after 300 days of sleep. It's nice to say today, but it was a very difficult task and we had to make a spacecraft within about 15 to 16 months from the start and we made it. So this has been the journey how we got the organization to get it done. And that is leadership. And that is team excellence. And let me just conclude by saying, what did I do to gain this knowledge and to perform in that role? Essentially, as I started with the formative phase, observe and study, evolve and refine, and then mentor. First and foremost is learnability. What you learn in the school and college will stay for a few years. And if one has to be professionally active, learning is a continuous process. Then comes your own values and attitudes, which we gain in the childhood from our home, from our schools, from the people who are around us, from our parents, teachers, and then how do you develop yourself as a holistic individual? And we see many people who did very well in the school, rank holders in the school and college, don't do it when they face actual situation, they become failure. What you require is a holistic development to face this world boldly. And that phase set the tune and tone of your development, that early phase. There is a question of, seeing the forest and counting the trees. As you grow, how you develop the conceptual skills. At the same time, ability to get into the details. This is important for the leader. Widen one's horizon. It's a continuous process. One would say I did electrical engineering, in my graduate and I continued to be the electrical engineer till the end of my life and career. No, what we learn in our college is only teaching us how to learn more. And as we progress, especially when the technology is advancing exponentially, one has to be a student every day, otherwise one becomes obsolete. As a leader, as a potential leader, as an aspiring leader, one has to sense opportunities. Opportunities don't come every day. One has to seize the opportunity as it comes. And one has to sense it in advance and prepare oneself to take that role. And we see a lot of people around us, successes, failures, all will be there, good leader, bad leader. But there is something to learn from everybody. One needs to adopt some of them. One needs to adapt 
to your liking, to your requirement, your value system. And there will be many things one should avoid. Then I talked about the word team excellence. There are many people who continue to say, I, 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 I did it, I did it. I got an organization, a very bad man. It was in shambles when I got it, but I made it. And there is no one in this organization who can take my role, I should continue. And this is what 80% of the people will speak. One should learn how to synergize the team, synergy for excellence. There could be individual islands of excellence, but that does not take us beyond a point. If we can have the excellence of all, then we get into the journey to Mars. Trust is very important. Trust from your colleagues, trust from the customers, trust from the stakeholders of all types. And if you make a statement, people should take it. And this is something which is difficult to build, but it is very easy to break trust. And the consistency in what you say comes out of this. If you tell the truth, you will be consistent. You don't have to think twice, what did I say yesterday? There are many people who don't like the junior colleagues to criticize them. They consider it disobedient. But a leader is powerful when the next level of people, the team members, are able to criticize the leader. Productive conflicts are important. One should be able to argue and level is not important. The truth is in between, and one has to find out that part of it. So encourage criticism from the people who report to the leader. And if it is with good intention, the best will come out of it. And when the best comes out of it, it is the team's output. If you have to do big things, you have to embrace adversities. If you want a smooth sailing, if you want to be in a comfort zone, you will never grow beyond a point. Look at the paddy field where if you don't do the transplantation, that plant will not grow. Similarly, in anyone's career, if you are very happy with a job near our hometown and be comfortable with a 10 to 4 hours job, then one has to be also reconciled to the fact that there is a limit to what one can achieve. Adversities are essential to prove or bring out the metal in every individual. Then one can learn. And finally, one should be able to make a difference. At the end of the day, one should be known with two or three words. If you can do that, your life has been of some use. And what happens after you leave? One senior colleague told me, in your absence of the organization works well, then you are a good leader. So grow a good succession line, learn how to delegate. And finally, try to live with a legacy. Don't work for a legacy. You work, and if you do a good job, you will leave a legacy. And finally, share, care, and inspire young people, and let that be a continuing responsibility. As an individual, I look at three things which are important. One is learn how to learn. Be a student all through the life. Try, strive to convert the knowledge into action by organizing the teams and getting all the resources required for that and all that is required. And finally, what you are counts till the end of your life and after your life. Being what you are, your character, your conscience, your value systems, 
these are all important. That's why some people are revered. Some people are called legendaries. Try to become, learn how they achieved that, and then one can be a good leader. Thank you very much. I stop at this time. It's eight o'clock. We can have some question and answers. That that is a great uh, masterclass, sir. I think you have explained in the most simple terms the journey of a leader and the essential qualities of leadership and what all it takes to be a successful leader with your own personal examples from your journey at ISRO, as well as several other frameworks of ethics, values, and building trust. And most importantly, what I remember, of course, it has been very simple and very clear to everyone, is transforming the islands of excellence into synergies of excellence. That's an amazing, amazing statement. And one has to work continuously, strive very, very hard to achieve that. And, and of course, a leader is known, recognized, and revered because uh, the leader leaves a legacy, having done his or her duty. So excellent, sir. I think uh, we couldn't have had a better uh, uh, session for the 50th conversation that we are organizing. As a matter of fact, sir, every Friday, without any interruption, holiday or no holiday, we think that learning has to continue. And every Friday evening, we have requested uh, some of the most distinguished leaders like you to come and share their wise views with our participants. And today, I'm extremely delighted that you have given us so many points to ponder, so many points to actually you know, write down and take home. And I'm very happy. From here, we will move on, sir. And now we will initiate the Q&A session. I would request uh, Professor R. Prasad to come in and uh, start the Q&A session. A brief introduction of Professor R. Prasad. He is the director of Academic Wing. Uh, he's an alumnus of IIT Bombay and I am Calcutta. And uh, he has... Uh, been an entrepreneur, uh, worked in the corporate, and now into academics. Uh, he brings uh, three decades of rich experience to the table. And ladies and gentlemen, we present Professor Rao Prasad. Good evening and welcome, Professor Prasad. Thank you, Professor Rao. Sir, it's indeed a, a privilege and a pleasure to have listened to you and in a very succinct uh, manner um, understood what it has taken for a, a, a very uh, uh, esteemed leader of ISRO to have uh, uh, you know, succeeded in, in, a, in a mission like Mars. Of course, a lot of other things which went into it, but I think that itself is something which uh, inspires us. It's, it's, it's an imagery which stands in our minds. Um, sir, I'll start with uh, uh, questions. I'll start with something a bit more on ISRO. ISRO is uh, one of those... Uh, top leading organizations in the world when you see particularly public sector organizations in India and you, you look at that, ISRO stands out. ISRO is known to uh, have produced a lot of leaders, each uh, distinguished and having accomplished uh, something. So what sets ISRO apart, sir? And uh, you know, in this context, what is the vision that uh, inspires so many leaders to come up, uh, collective, you know, at various levels and at, 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 at the frequency which one after another, which, which, which inspires the nation and also takes it into the direction of being one of the best in the world. Your view, sir. The credit goes to a couple of people who started this program and who steered this program. Dr. Vikram Sarabhai and Professor Sadish Thawan, who came in that sequence to lead the organization for more than two decades. They were great individuals, great human beings. One was a great scientist, one was a great engineer. And they had a world vision and an outlook for life. And they respected each other. And they essentially made the difference for the leadership of his role of two decades to create a vision of what India should do in the space program, which was totally different from what the great pioneers were trying to do. 
see how it is relevant for this nation. That means you have a responsibility to the society, which was underscored. And both believed in the people, in the ability of the people. They had the focus, they had the dream, they had the focus. And they were able to synergize this excellence, shared vision, being relevant and significant, and take the entire organization in the whole process of planning and delivery. And they led by example. And for them, this was not a career. They had already achieved in their profession whatever one would aspire. But this was a service. So selfless service. This is something which they showed and taught all of us. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I think uh, 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 the platform that they have set uh, has worked so well and we are able to see so many leaders who have come and I think you did emphasize the world vision aspect as well as the outlook for life aspect and I think if one wants to set up really great organizations these are characteristics which will need to go go one has to that kind of mission orientation selfless service beyond immediate you know rewards which are there thank you sir uh, so when you come to the India's vision for space and compare it with how it is positioned with respect to other global organizations, space agencies, countries, space agencies, etc. What is distinct about India's uh, vision? Space sir? application for society, which is the vision that India showed to the world will work. And in the late 50s, early 60s, when America and Soviets, China, Europe all started, their emphasis was on technology and leadership in technology in a bipolar world, competition. But here there was one country which emphasized on application of using communication, remote sensing satellites for the problems of the society and the people. And they took almost uh, two to three decades for the world to realize that, yes, that is the way to go. And then came in 2000 plus systems for that application. And if you look at the sustainability development goals, SDG 2030, essentially they talk about use of space technology for sustainable development on the other side, the climate change and the disaster management. Excellent, sir. I think uh, there is a very basic point here, the social organization with the social purpose versus a competitive organization and how both of them ran and how at the end of the day, impact has made a difference. Impact to society has indeed made a difference and has made India stand out. And I think that also brought in a lot of uh, uh, benefits in terms of how uh, you know money was spent and uh, costs were lowered and uh, you know uh, great returns were ensured at a very low cost. So the next question is about Mars. There are a lot of initiatives on Mars. Uh, why is Mars so important? Uh, considering the challenges and the opportunity costs. People also talk about that it costs, should you do this, should you do something else? So why is mass so important, sir? See, human being has always been fascinated to know more about the universe. So space exploration, space science is an important element of that inquiry. And understanding about moon, understanding about Mars, and understanding about Earth and Sun which is very important for any human being in the planet Earth. To know about our origin, to know probably what will be the future, far, far future, et cetera, et cetera, it is important. So this is one aspect. The second one, these days we talk about also exploitation of celestial resources. Maybe a few decades later, there could be a habitat in moon we should be able to bring back to Earth some of the minerals, etc. etc. Also, possibly, one could attempt for habitat in Mars. So, this is another aspect which is being looked at. All these require cutting edge technologies to be developed. The third thing is in the geopolitical situation, of course, one knows about the ownership of 
Earth in different regions. There is a question when Antarctica was being explored. Who owns Antarctica? Especially the people who do certain activities in that place had an arrangement. Tomorrow, what happens to moon? Several people are going and doing exploration, studies, landing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Who owns it actually? What should be the kind of discipline? What should be the kind of rules of law, etc.? Cetera, et cetera? Who creates that rule? And do you want a role in that process? One has to do certain activities. The same thing happens to Mars too. So there are scientific uh, imperatives, there are geopolitical imperatives, there are technological requirements, all these will drive us actually. And when you develop cutting edge technologies for these explorations, they become really useful for the space application. People were using telescopes to look at sky. When those instruments were started looking at Earth, <clears throat> they got the remote sensing technology, which is used to now help the paddy fields, forest, water resources, etc., etc., etc. So anything that we do for the planetary exploration certainly will tomorrow help the other application-centric programs. For example, in Mars, we had to have a smart satellite, a satellite which can take its own decisions without any contact with the ground controller for at least two to three weeks time. And in any state of emergency at any point of time, the satellite should be able to protect itself. This was built in Mars. Tomorrow, this is going to improve all of our remote sensing communication navigation satellites. Same thing happens with the ground operations. So it is technology that comes back, the spin-off from the systems for humanity. Excellent, sir. I think uh, uh, here we have talked about uh, various dimensions of uh, human behavior. I think you looked at the philosophical dimension, this nature of the human being. You looked at the competitive angle. How do we take care of ourselves when others are going to take care of themselves? And you've also looked at the common mission of getting what we want in terms of resources. And at the same time, uh, so many new opportunities with our, which are thrown up, perhaps no other venture will do that in terms of the kind of opportunities which are thrown up for humankind in terms of the progress, in terms of the technologies. And, uh, and, and of course, uh, you know how human beings collaborate with each other. Thank, thank you very much, sir. I think this, this, this is something that is very special about space. Uh, so the last question in this cluster is, uh, how did you plan your journey to the mass? Are there any fundamental principles, frameworks that you used, which you can, which will, which will help many of us who are in uh, not so complicated fields, but see, how do we move from uh, earth to other planets? This is very well known in theory. There are two, three options available, two, three ways of reaching that. So what we looked at was what is the minimum energy transfer from Earth to Mars? So you come to a point in the Earth's orbit where you start leaving from the sphere of influence and then move around the sun and then go near Mars, capture the orbit of Mars. That is one way of doing it. Now, if you look at the classical way of uh, doing this, one has to get into that area of sphere where the sphere of influence from the Earth is and uh, Mars is reached. From there, you have to leave. But to reach that point, you reach, require a powerful rocket, almost 10 times of what India had at that time. So we used a very novel method. First, we got into a smaller orbit and raise that orbit in a few stages using some of the fundamental physics, essentially. It required some 15 days of extra stay in the orbit around Earth. And finally, we reached that point where normally every other country will start its journey. So between the launch of November 5th to December 1st, we were going around Earth. And then we started the journey to Mars. Two things happened. When we did this, of course, we could do it with a small rocket, PSL, from Sri But in, we could test each and every instrument and all, all modes of operation 
and the satellite was still in the orbit of Earth, which opportunity we will never get if you were just traveling towards Mars. So that was a blessing for us. The second one, the most important element was the direction in which you move from Earth's sphere of influence. That required very complex calculations on the impact of all other celestial bodies on the spacecraft during the next 300 days of journey. And that was the test for our uh, orbital mechanics, mathematics community. And we did that. And because we did that, we didn't have to use much fuel for correction during the course of journey. That is why when we said we will have six months of life, today still we are having a live satellite doing its job. We didn't waste much of fuel for corrections because our calculations were good. The last point was uh, breaking the velocity. If you did not capture that uh, orbit of Mars, it would have gone into the universe somewhere, it would have been wandering around. So you have to use a propulsion system to break, which has to operate after 300 days, which we did diligently, and we captured the orbit. But the entire thing we did in about four years time from concept to fruition. When in America, for their 22nd mission, they had 11 years of preparation. And this is where our USP comes. Here, we were working for a national cause, national pride, once in lifetime opportunity for us. It was our devotion and dedication that was uppermost rather than being a job that one was doing for a salary on a contract basis. So the differences are so stark. Yeah. Uh, you brought it out very well. And you've, you've, you've looked at, uh, you know, the, though this is a lot of physics, you've identified the fundamental places where you've thought very differently. And you've not used what others have used. You've, you've yes. completely um, uh, started from basic principles and, and, and done it. If I may say with all humility, we use the word uh, disruptive technology. This was a disruption in interplanetary exploration. Absolutely, sir. I think that is that is uh, you know, music to the ears of those who practice uh, management. And I think now it has forced others to look at it very similarly. And it is proven that this, it has happened this way. Thank, thank you very much, sir. I, we end this cluster. I hand it back to Professor Sudhakar Rao for the next. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, sir, these clusters of questions are actually obtained from all the participants at the time of registration, and then we logically bucket them so that we, we have some kind of landscaping done to evolve a discussion meaningful for us to jot down the uh, takeaways as well. To me personally, so far, the discussion has been so interesting that the way you have approached the entire Mangalyan project and the way you succinctly identified for a common man, just some three, four bullet points that you mentioned, the whole discussion is actually moving in the direction. In the sense that you have created a framework of leadership, expectations of leadership, aspirations, and the things to be done as a framework in the initial stages. That is when the, from November to December, how it stayed within the orbit of Earth and, uh, and test was possible for you. Every single opportunity for testing was done. And subsequently, you created and experimented several other methods to you know, take advantage of our journey. So similarly, the last question has actually exploded us, has taken us into that orbit. That's what I was enjoying. Uh, so the second uh, uh, cluster has got some questions about the leadership per se. We have seen ISRO having successful leaders, a variety of successful leaders. How does ISRO select its leaders? Uh, is, there, is there any insight into that, sir? The first two leaders came from outside. Mm -hmm. Dr. Vikram Sarabhai was a cosmic ray physicist. And he had knowledge of using satellites for space science. And he started his own laboratory, the physical research laboratory at Ahmedabad, the late 50s. 
when the modern space age started and india wanted to get into that was the year 1961 when the prime minister requested chairman atomic energy commission dr homi baba to start this program initially space program was presiding in atomic energy and then he looked at dr vikram sarabhai and requested him to chair the space program at that time it was called indian committee on space research in gospar in 1969 70 professor sadish thawan who was then director of indian institute of science and an aeronautics engineer from caltech was inducted into the atomic energy commission by sarabhai and within one year of course sarabhai passed away and dhawan became the natural choice and he continued in that role while he was the director of indian institute of science but from then all leaders were home group whether the directors of the isro centers the project directors who took very important role and who have very important role in isro's programs and all the leaders all were home grown people we did not have lateral entry from middle level onwards only at the entry point in the first three levels we have new persons coming into the system but what is more important is sky is the limit for working in isro it was the case in the early phase especially and one could get into several areas of activity there were several platforms in which one could show the potential and there were people in the organization to look for those parts and promote them so development of leaders was also an important agenda for all of them just to give you an example in the year 2011 i had a document on succession planning and leadership development from 2011 to 2025 and i should say the successors whom i had and the people who are in the isro centers as directors etc are all part of this process and we have been also grown like that by our predecessors fantastic that's a, that's a very inspiring journey of uh, having home grown leaders for a large part of the history of isro and also having what is uh, very very distinctly coming out is having a succession plan and having a leadership pipeline developed yeah. for a large part of a, say a decade and a half or two decades and a half a kind of succession plan has been laid out by yourself sir so we are so fortunate to listen to you on that particular aspect thank you sir uh, if i may move to the next one there are many challenges that you have uh, spoken about we read about we have seen in the movies and other things but for the purpose of this discussion with a focus on the lessons that we have learned what could be those important uh, say three important challenges that we faced during the mangalyaan project and more importantly what are the lessons that we have learned uh, uh, from these challenges see for any complex mission the devil is in the detail one can have a grand plan one can have thousands of people committed to that program if i may say in 24th september we had the orbit capture that even which the world was looking at to prepare for that particular event almost 200 people who were in the mission operations sat together for 7 days including me we spent about 7 to 8 hours a day looking at all possible eventualities all possible problems that can come and we were ready with all contingency plans we were also able to plan in advance and take actions to ensure that we are close to success so this is very important when i said we have to see the forest and count the tree we have to have conceptual skills at the same time we should be able to get into the detail it is that minutest detail finally which could make 
the difference between a success and failure in any space mission. So this is very important. The second lesson is we all said that we did the work in uh, four month, four years from start to end. Satellite was made in 15 to 16 months, etc., etc. It requires a few thousands of people to be galvanized. And this process is not through any order. It is to come from within. So when we plan for this Mars program and then when we said we are going to take up this challenge, he shared this with everybody, got their view and everybody was ready to do that, to work for 16, 17, 18 hours a day, even sleep in the office because satellite had 24 hours a day for itself. People had to work around that and we did that. The third part of it is all this high technology is wonderful. We had to wait for one month after the satellite was ready to launch it because we had to use two shipborne terminals located in Pacific Ocean because the injection of the satellite had to be seen from there. There was a tornado in Pacific Ocean and the shipborne terminals while they were traveling from India to Pacific had technical problems. Diesel generator not working. So the mundane problem of a diesel generator not working in a ship made us wait for one month. So it is not the high tech alone in high techs. The low techs also can give problem for us. So one should not overlook even the silliest, the smallest things. So these are the three lessons I would say are important. That's, that's pretty, pretty awesome, sir. I think uh, uh, these lessons are applicable anywhere in large projects, small projects, within organizations, in society, in real life. I think these are true. See the forest and you should be able to count the trees. I think that's the statement, umbrella statement and an eye for detail, which will differentiate between a successful mission and a not successful mission. And as you have highlighted, the failure of a diesel engine in a ship could also be the cause for your delay. So therefore we need to account for all these small, small things. But the biggest and the most interesting aspect is of the people being galvanized. They're working for several hours per day and uh, huddling together and planning it together is like, you know, spreading the ownership across a large body of people of course, it is just a function of leadership as I gather from this discussion, sir. This huddling part is pretty good. Uh, sir, I will now move to in the interest of time very fast and I will uh, take this next question. When funding of the projects is huge, in India, all these projects cost huge money. Given our own track record of uh, huge investments, uh, especially in space related uh, technology and projects, it also comes with lots of risks. There's always a scope for critics. How uh, would you take those decisions? Because in the face of criticism, in the face of uh, huge funding kind of projects, how would you navigate yourself and how would you manage various stakeholders? That is the point. I welcome and I respect critics because that is essential to put that fire in our belly and perform better. Obviously, in a country like India, when you spend uh, money for the space program, some people consider it an exotic activity when we have got poverty. So that is one kind of issue. This will continue to be asked and this has to be answered. This was asked in the 60s. This was asked also in 2000 plus. I was asked in 2013, 2014 period, whether we want roti or rocket. This was in the India Today conclave of 2014 April. The answer was we require rockets for rotis. Because the space technology is used today for agriculture, water, disaster management, etc., etc., etc. One should be able to see. So our commitment for space application is the one which defends us in all these situations, how it is really useful. The second one is when we do that also, we should do a cost-effective program. And that is what India has been looking at. And the, the technology development has been planned in such a way that we can do with lesser amount of expenses. The kind of modular design that we have, the kind of uh, testing 
philosophy that we have, the optimization that we do in those areas, all help us to reduce the cost. It is not because just because the salary is low here. It is the way we plan these technical activities. It's a philosophy that we follow. So these are all important. And generally, when somebody criticizes, we should be able to take the signal from that criticism. Question is not who is it and when is it or what is it or she said. That signal has to be taken and one should work to ensure that that mishap doesn't occur. So then you get into the next level. So if somebody is putting a hurdle in front of you, you should be able to jump. You will get the strength to jump. So this is another part of it. Because that fire is created in you that I should perform and show, which is required for an organization. So criticism is a must. If you don't have criticism, you become complacent. And then you decay. Fantastic, sir. Fantastic. Very nice explanation of how do we deal with critics and how do we use that energy also into positive energy of you know fueling ourselves towards the stated uh, goal for the country, rocket to rotis. I think uh, that's a fantastic uh, view. So one last question in this cluster and then we will move to the next. Uh, while handling this project, you have been in this uh, uh, space program, space technology for quite some time. What are your, I mean, don't take it as individually, but as a leader, what are your expectations from bureaucrats and political bosses? Because they're also stakeholders. We can't wish away, uh, but dealing with certain set of people, what would be the expectations of a leader of your stature? My general philosophy is strength recognizes strength. And if you deliver, you will be respected. This is the case with every stakeholder. This, this is true to all the stakeholders. All, all stakeholders. Great. Fantastic. Fantastic. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, I'll now call back uh, Professor Prasad uh, to start the next cluster. And after that, we will open the window for a few questions from the audience as well. They have keyed in a few new questions. Okay. We will take that up. But Professor Prasad, uh, first to you. Thank you, Professor Rao. Uh, sir, collaboration uh, seems to be a key buzzword in space, given the cost, the time factors, the multiple priorities which are there. In your uh, experience, what are the essentials which are there to collaborate successfully? I think today this pervades all fields of life. To collaborate successfully with space agencies of other countries yeah. as well as if private you, players in India. If you look at the space program, it started with competition in a bipolar position. But as the world changed, in a multipolar world, today in space, we see competition, of course, there, but collaboration and cooperation. These are all important. If I say multilateral cooperation and bilateral cooperation exist in space, both parties in a multilateral cooperation should be able to bring something to the table. And when you look at any interplanetary object like Moon or Mars, we should realize that we are one from Earth looking at these bodies. So today people talk about global space exploration roadmap for the next 20 years, how different space agencies can contribute with their strength, different elements of a program to look at Moon and to look at Mars. And if you look at International Space Station, which exists now, is a classic example of different countries coming together to build a platform in space and utilize that space, not only for themselves, but offer it to others also. There are bilateral corporations. India had done wonderfully well with France in building two spacecraft, Megatropis and Saral, launched from India. Today, we are working with NASA from 2014 onwards to build a remote sensing satellite together and then again launch from here. There are many such programs coming up. The bottom line in this is everyone should have a niche in which that nation, that space agency excels. Then one can talk about cooperation. Yes. I think the ability to bring something different to the table that others are not able to bring in the best possible manner yeah. underlies uh, collaboration. Uh, 
So the next question in this cluster is about uh, the space tech used by ISRO. How much of it is indigenous? What are the opportunities in this area for Indian entrepreneurs? Uh, there, are what two, is, yeah, yeah, yes. there are two elements of your question. One is the space technology, what is indigenous? There are important elements in the space program, but if you look at a launch vehicle like PSLV, roughly 70 to 80% are from India, from the material onwards. But if you get into electronics, if you get into certain materials, they still have to be imported, but the rest of it is here. When you talk about the spacecrafts, which have to work for a longer period in the space environment, there are certain stipulations, requirements for the electronic devices, etc., which have to perform in radiation environment. Those areas, there are a few more things which are important. But generally, that will be about, let us say, 50 to 60, 70 percent, depending upon which type of spacecraft you are talking about. The next question is, about the opportunities for the industry. Right from 70s, ISRO had a philosophy that we will not grow as a monolith for everything. We will leverage on the Indian industry's capability, private or public, for building launch vehicles, spacecrafts, ground systems. That's why today we have got almost 150 industrial houses from large to micro working for ISRO, but they were working as jobbing partners. And the question is, how do we bring all of them together? They go up in the value chain up and then take responsibility for making launch vehicles or making spacecrafts. So today we have got two programs. One is the NSIL which is supposed to take up this responsibility of operational systems. And the in-space, which is supposed to catalyze, empower, promote the uh, private sector to be a co-passenger in the space activity. That is the space sector reforms of 2020 June, which will make all the difference, which provides a lot of opportunity for the startups to take a lead role not a jobbing partner, which is coming up now. Thank you, sir. I think you've brought out two very important points. First is the inbuilt philosophy that was there in the organization. And second is the change in gear right now. We're moving from jobbing partners to that of significant value addition. I hand this, uh, the, this back to Professor Rao for the last phase. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, sir. I have a couple of questions. Uh, before that, I request uh, the participant to raise their hand so that we will open the window for you to ask. Meanwhile, I will pursue with the first one. Sir, uh, uh, with, the, with the journey of uh, ISRO and with the space sector actually being opened up for private, uh, I'm sure you are at the helm of many academic institutions as well in the country. So what are some of the uh, trending startup ideas in aerospace industry? See, when you talk about uh, the space industry, there are three broad areas. One is downstream services. That's on the ground. You make use of the satellite's capability, remote sensing, communication, navigation, and use your ingenuity to provide new services. Either making use of one type of satellite or putting all of them together. And world over, this takes almost 50 to 60% of space economy. They are low risk, but the market will be large. The second aspect of it is building ground equipment that are required to use these space systems, including the navigation receivers, handheld devices, etc., etc. In olden days, it used to be large ground stations, but today we talk about smaller handheld systems. The last one is building satellites and launch vehicles. In the space economy, these two elements, which are very risky, very complex, take about 10% in terms of turnover. But that gives 
the technological challenge. They are going to be the cutting edge new technology. And it's a very happy state of situation that today there are a few at least in this country who are working in these areas, like electric propulsion, for example. So there is a lot of scope. And if India has to move from the current level of sixth in the world to two or three or one in some areas, it is this technology leadership that will make all the difference. And that is the challenge for the new generation. And where do they come from? They come from some of our engineering, science institutions. And I should say, except a handful of people in the beginning, everyone who were in this row, who are in this row, are from Indian colleges. The same thing is going to happen in the future also. Maybe some of them who are working for the foreign companies might come back and join. That's another idea. Now comes to the cardinal point. If you look at US, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory and the Caltech, they got a wonderful model actually. Academic institutions leading in the development of cutting edge technologies and cutting edge frontier programs. In India, we have a lot to do in that area. And today, there is a move towards that. We started in the 70s with small, small projects where a professor guided a student they came up with a paper. But later, in the 90s, in 2000 plus, we could see at least a dozen institutions having large number of projects, many people associated with that. Space technology cells coming up in these institutes. And today they are all looking at centers. And they are going to look at larger problems and contribute in a very major way. This is a very positive thing. For example, in IIT Kanpur, we have started a new department for space science, engineering, etc. Et in IIT Indo, there is a department for space sciences. So this is something which is happening. And they are going to produce a lot of technologies who will look at space as their engagement. Fantastic, sir. Fantastic. I think you have explained uh, what is required. What is required is the tech leadership, you know, to move from the current position to the top. And how? How is participation of focused academic institutions in this space tech cutting edge technology leadership is also required and therefore we can collectively grow. I think that's a great vision and you are part of this particular program as it is ruling out in various institutions that you are also uh, at the advisory and the top uh, board, board level. Thank you very much, sir. One of the participants has uh, raised the hand, so I will request uh, Ms. Anita Raman to ask the question. Uh, Srikan, can you please open that window? Please go ahead. Respected, sir. It seems, uh, you know, in fact, it is overwhelming to hear you. It's like a infinite gratitude for all the insights that you have given. So my question, if I could ask you humbly, is to be a great leader, one has to be very good at managing oneself first. So if I may humbly request you to share your personal journey to be an inspirational leader to all of us, it would help us. Thank you so much. I have always been an ordinary person, like any one of you, not different from you. First, be a human being okay. and love people, work with people, do what you can do in any capacity that you have. Second comes life work balance that we all talk about. That makes a lot of difference. Sometimes if you're only interested in your career, you forget everything, including your family life, including your own health. And finally, you will find that you have not achieved anything and you become a total failure in your personal life. Mm. It's important to care. Unless you have a wall, you cannot have a painting on the wall. So you have to have your health. One should be healthy. One should have a happy family life and then you can contribute for your work, for your society or anywhere else. 
and having hobby it's also important to clear your mind your mind should be with you he talk about mindful leadership these days mm. so how do you take your mind to work properly especially in adverse situations right mind should be with you then you can be cool and uh, as you grow up in the career and as you grow old as your responsibilities around personally you also go up there will be sufficient opportunities for you to get into that stage so you should be able to keep your mind under control and whatever helps that in a sustainable manner do that i use the word sustainable manner very with a lot of meaning into that music has helped me arts has helped me ability to appreciate that and ability also to perform on many occasions thank and you how so do you do time management that's also important okay. 18 hours a day is available to you other than your sleep how do you spend that time with you thank you so much sir if you could also uh, ask you how did you manage your mind that might help many of us i will give you an example i have written this in my book when i had the first year of my chairmanship in 2010 with two failures first failure people okay said fine first attempt but then again it happened in uh, december they were not ready to forgive me people said uh, he has to hang his boots at that time the social media was not so famous but internet was there people were writing on the blogs also and i had to answer to everyone within the organization outside the organization to the government etc etc so that time in uh, okay 31st of march 31st of december i was not in a mood to even reply to any of the new year messages that i got so my wife and my niece thought they get some good shirt for me i'll be a bit better they went to do shopping and they came back nothing happened in me but i know music so i sat there with the music my shruti box and sang for 2 to 2 and a half hours briskly all the varnams that i knew at very high speed and at the end of it i found as if a rain has washed off everything in my head and within 15 days i went for two music concerts in bangalore and while returning i told my driver chandra that i am ready for my next launch chandra is important because he is one person who understands everything that goes on in my mind at least while traveling to shahar coming back etc 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 so that made all the difference for me this is something which is very visible and it's sample which i can tell you amazing sir thank you for your wonderful insights and infinite gratitude for taking out time to share your valuable insights with all of us it's truly inspiring thank you wonderful sir uh, there are others also who have raised the hands and i am not able to see the hand so they can actually volunteer srikanth if you can help me we can open their windows as well yeah please go ahead anjana matta uh, good evening sir uh, it's a wonderful lecture it's a uh, interact with you sir it's a great for us also i my question is when the india will Uh, the isro will start this space tourism in india actually see so, space tourism is slightly exotic i would say but india has a program to take human beings to the space that is the gaganyaan program which should happen in the next 2 uh, or 3 years isro is working very seriously on it so whether it is for tourism or whether it is for exploration taking a human being into space is the challenge because one for a given number of days or weeks or years the human being should be able to live in that cabin with the necessary life support system with the conducive environment when there is a space environment around the second point is the safety of this human being and the crew module that carries the human being during the launch is extremely important 
and more than that when they come back to earth how do we cut across that barrier where you have high heating that's around 100 to 120 kilometers when they cross that area so these are all technology challenges which isro is working on and we should be able to see that happening in the next 2 to 3 years thank you thank you sir thank you very much uh, anjana uh, can we have the next person quickly so that we say on time lakshmi yeah go ahead namaskaram sir namaskaram salutation to your dedication and to all your team i have a small technical question you said that mars mission will be self propelled and it will be self managed the satellite so will it have any capability to meet the primary goal in some eventuality to set up some of its own sub goals sub task and maybe a capability to fabricate i shown some equipments say some camera or something like that whatever may be the thing to meet the eventuality which may arise during the operation some practical difficulty its own goal to fabricate some equipment and control its own the equipments on its own without the ground control not fabricate but control itself during eventualities it will be able to control only itself it it should be able to control itself see what happens is for a spacecraft that is going around the earth there are several commands the ground controllers send yeah one to know its help second one there are certain operations to be done like station keeping keeping the orbit attitude all under check etc etc and third thing is when some equipment within the system go bad the substitute for that which we call the standby has to be brought into the situation when something goes bad again one has to understand what is bad and then try to find out a way of overcoming that all this happens so continuous dialogue between the ground controller and the spacecraft take place but when the spacecraft is in the earth orbit you don't lose much time in this operation but when it is around mars that one way travel for the signal could be anything up to 20 minutes that means if something happens in the spacecraft for us to know it will take about 20 minutes maximum then for a correction that we apply from here to a signal it will also take another 20 minutes in between there is a time for decision making that means by the time the corrective measure reaches there the spacecraft would have already gone still further back maybe sometimes untracked so what happens in this process you have to provide certain ability for the spacecraft to detect those problems and then take action so that is what we have been building so many decision or the decision rules that we do on the ground had to be translated into algorithms programs built into the computer in the space craft number one number two we also had to ensure that we doesn't take a wrong decision so all these were done and tested and the proof of the pudding is the space craft at least for a couple of weeks will be out of ground or earth's visibility it will be on the other side of the sun and it manages and it comes back so eventualities can be managed but not it can it cannot fabricate anything that is not possible it's not planned for Great. thank you sir Great. thank, thank you, you so much, much. Uh, one last question that we can take from the audience and then we will wrap it up ajaya yeah ajaya please unmute yourself we cannot hear you please unmute good evening sir good please evening go ahead. please yeah. go ahead and ask the question good evening ask your question yes sir very happy to see you and listen to you sir now as far as uh, space research is concerned uh, where do you see india right now and uh, in 2050 probably uh, where you see uh, see india sir say to as of now yes sir we are somewhere around 6th Okay. Except for the human space flight capability, India is there in all other areas. Whether it is communication satellites, Earth observation satellites, navigation satellites, or lunar 
planetary exploration and launch vehicle capability to some extent, we are there. Now, what India is going to be in the year 2050 or 2047, that's what the new generation is now working out. We are all part of that program. Obviously, we cannot be at sixth, we may not be first, but in many of these space portfolios, India should have number one position. For example, in space applications, India is considered to be a role model because we had a concerted program through a vision and we realized in a large country with all its uh, cultural, geographic, sociological diversities, a very vibrant space application program rather than just limiting it to a few technical papers published and read by a few people. But in technology too, there are areas in which India can excel. And that's what we are trying to do with all these new space startups and the young blood getting into space technology, novel way of looking at it. So we will have, and space is going to be one of the main parameters on which the modern world is going to be looking at. And India has to excel in that area. So probably you all will be doing that. Sir? The young generation will be doing that. Yes. Right, sir. So I think uh, that is a fantastic conversation we have had. The benefit of your presence in this webinar is immense. And it has addressed several aspects that we are not knowing earlier. And there are several templates of leadership which are enmeshed with a hugely successful program, a shortest span within four years that you have launched. I think from that itself, there are several lessons and templates of. Before you conclude, let me make a statement. Yes, sir. Yes. I really enjoyed the way both uh, you and uh, Professor Prasad interpreted my answers. I think they were better than my answers. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, sir. So if you permit me, I'll, for the benefit of all our viewers, I'll do a small uh, summary and then we can conclude after that, sir. Uh, ISRO is the fourth space agency in the world after NASA, Russian Federal Space Agency and European Space Agency, which has successfully undertaken a mission to Mars. India managed to put a satellite in the Martian orbits on its very first attempt. The skepticism was very high when India announced this mission. The, the, the record was 30 Mars missions out of 51 failed. It was also dubbed as an attempt to do too little what NASA has already achieved in the 60s and 70s. Against this, Mangalyaan is the first spacecraft to be launched outside the sphere of influence by ISRO. The Mars Orbiter mission MOM being the first Indian interplanetary mission needed to develop new spacecraft and technology. ISRO utilized the available hardware to make the spacecraft and used PSLV as a launch vehicle with minimum modifications. The mission over with overriding commitment to application to society was to explore the atmosphere, topography, mineralogy and morphology to observe the environment of Mars and look for various elements like methane or marsh gas, which is a possible indicator of life. Also to look for deuterium hydrogen ratio and other neutral constants. Mangalyaan mission was considered as a triumph of frugal engineering and therefore the most inexpensive Mars mission till date at about $75 million. Attributed to the working together of bubbling youth and experienced elders, Mangalyaan made India the first country to launch a successful mission to Mars within Asia. It proved India's ability to achieve success in interplanetary missions with efficiency. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we have heard the Mars Muni himself talking about how the attention to detail and how long vision, vision for the country as well as vision for the people who are working for the country will ensure results and attention to detail with the utmost care and huge responsibility has helped. On the personal side, a leaf out of the practices by Dr. Radhakrishnan himself is to maintain the work-life balance, harnessing your own hobbies, and also managing time. 
will definitely help us work towards sharing, caring, and inspiring the rest of the people that we will be dealing with, either, either in our organizations or in society, wherever we are. So we will be revered and remembered only when we care to strengthen ourselves, create our own excellence, and also move towards synergizing all the excellences together to achieve the common purpose. So it cannot be more befitting for our 50th leadership conversation than having Dr. K. Radhakrishnan with us talking about leadership lessons from the journey of Mars. Thank you very much, sir, from all of us here for this gyan, for this expertise and your valuable time. We are highly indebted to you. We will write a small summary and share it with you as well and take your views. We'll share the recording of this conversation before we put it on our archives. Thank you very much once again, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And ladies and gentlemen, we'll see you next Friday at same time, 7.30 p.m. with yet another distinguished leader. And that is on April 8th. Till then, do take care and come back for more learning. I wish everyone, including Dr. Radhakrishnan, a very happy Ugadi, Gudi Padwa, and all of the festivities around this time that are prevalent in the country from, from tomorrow. Have a good time, do take care, and come back for learning. We will be waiting for you on April 8th at 7.30 p.m. Thank you and good Thank night. You. Thank you.